Industrial Security Podcast with Andrew Ginter and Nate Nelson. Sponsored by Waterfall Security Solutions. Welcome listeners to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm here with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's going to introduce the subject and the guest of today's show. Andrew, how are you? I'm well. Thank you, Nate. Our guest today is Jake Brodsky, one of the pioneers of industrial security. He is an author. He's the co-editor of the Handbook of SCADA and Control System Security. He's a researcher. Jake and his partner, uh, Bob Radvanowski, ran the Shine Project that found a half million control system devices connected to the Internet. He's the co-founder of SCADASEC, which is the longest running mailing list on industrial security. We're talking today with Jake about self-consistency checks in industrial control systems and their security benefits. Okay, here's you and Jake Brodsky. So, Jake, you're a long-time, uh, you know, engineer practicing in the water industry. Um, you know, lately you've been doing work with petrochemical plants and chemical plants. Can you tell me what do these physical processes look like? Well, in many respects, they're very, very similar. People forget that when you treat water, you have to treat it with some fairly high energy chemical uh, chemistry processes. Um, this is because whenever you uh, treat parts per mil- uh, whenever you treat millions of gallons of anything, whatever reagents you're using are going to have to be very concentrated. And uh, unless you really want to be taking tanker loads of the stuff every single hour of every single day, so the from a logistics perspective, the equipment that you use is uh, just as dangerous regardless of what business you're in. If you're busy making petrochemicals, you usually worry about explosive risks. But with water, you have corrosive risks, you have um, asphyxiation risks, you have uh, dealing with some fairly high energy things like gaseous chlorine, sulfur dioxide, methanol, things of that sort. So at the end of the day, things, the policies and procedures and all the other things that you normally do look remarkably similar. And what does what does an automation system look like in these environments? In water, you tend to see very big, massively parallel processes. And this is because they cannot shut down. And that is a really serious difference between water and virtually every other process out there. Uh, in water, you don't shut down unless you have another resource ready to put online to uh, uh, take its place. You, you don't let the pipes run dry. So typically what you see in water treatment plants are many, many smaller versions of the same thing over and over again. And that gives you the ability to do um, in-service maintenance. I don't know that it's necessarily the same thing when you're dealing with the petrochemical industry. Obviously, the startup and shutdown of a process is very expensive and somewhat dangerous. So you have to think about those logistics in there. but you can shut it down, even if it isn't uh, something that you really want to do. In the water business, you, you often have to do preemptive maintenance, and uh, in, just as you would with uh, petrochemical. And um, in the water business, for example, we often do vibration monitoring. We'll be looking at things like a lime slaker that we might be using to adjust the pH of the water, and we get uh, shipments of pebble lime and then you have to turn that into something that you can mix into the water supply safely. So um, bottom line is that uh, uh, if it shuts down due to getting clogged, which is not uncommon, then you have to have people ready to react at all hours of the day, and you probably need a backup somewhere to bring online to take its place. So you gave an example of you know the lime slaker shutting down or maybe jamming up. Is there a sensor that tells us, is the thing, is the thing running? Um, you know, and, you know, if it thinks it's running, but in fact it's stuck somehow, is there a sensor for that? Or are you figuring that out a different way? There should be multiple sensors involved, and there should be multiple ways of figuring this out. Um, for example, if the pH of the water is not getting corrected the way you expect it to, well, that's a pretty clear indication. But those are generally lagging indicators. Um, you can have um, current consumption by the machine itself. You can monitor that. You could also monitor the vibration on the machine, which is something else that would give you precursors if, uh, for failure. 
And all this goes back to a PLC somewhere that has to manage the device and um, perhaps warn you before it gets to a stage where it'll uh, cut out thermally. Um, the PLC, hopefully, is not just one PLC. You should have multiple PLCs, and this way you'd have uh, advance warning from a number of different disparate uh, locations saying, hey, the lime slaker is about to shut down because of thermal overload or because of the uh, high torque or whatever else it might be. Andrew, it doesn't sound to me like this is going to be too relevant to industrial security specifically, but just so I could follow along with the example, what is a lime slaker? A lime slaker, uh, in my understanding, is a, a device that runs uh, water that you're being treated, water that, you know, that you're treating for drinking water. It runs the, the water through a, uh, a device that contains lime. Lime is something you, you as far as I know, that you mine, uh, you know, limestone. And uh, the, the process uh, modifies the water chemically. It takes the, the you know, if, if you have very hard water that's just hard, you know, it's so, so much mineral dissolved in it that it, you know, it's hard to work with, it's hard to wash any dishes with. You run it through the lime slaker and the mineral parts, the mineral ions precipitate out of the water. They sort of connect to the lime or something chemically. It's a complicated process that I don't really understand. But what I do know is that water come, you know, hard water comes in and softer water comes out because the mineral's been removed and lime has to come in and it's used up in the process, uh, you know, and, and, you know, when it's chemically exhausted, whatever that means, I don't really know, it comes out the process on the other end. So you need a continuous supply of lime into this lime slaker. And, uh, you know, the example that, that Jake was giving was you turn on the motor to push more lime into the lime slaker or to start the lime slaker going. And, uh, you know, he's talking about, you know, lagging indicators. He's coming up on his consistency uh, concept. But fundamentally, he's talking about measuring the output of a physical process. If we turn on the lime slaker, what do we expect to have happen? Well, you know, five or 10 minutes later, we should be able to measure the output of the uh, the drinking water purification process and notice that it has uh, a different pH. It has different uh, chemical properties. It doesn't have all these, these ions in it anymore. Now, what he called that process, he called measuring the, the, the pH, the acidity of the water, he called that a lagging indicator, meaning that we can measure it, but it's sometime down the road it's minutes or or more down the road from the activity of the lime slaker and he started talking about other kinds of measurements that you might have to answer the question is the lime slaker working and the big question here that he's leading into is you know here's there's a bunch of techniques we can use to ask the question is this physical operation working properly or has something very strange just gone wrong and that you know has something very strange just gone wrong question is one that's very relevant to industrial security so he's getting into this the the consistency is coming up next so let's let's jump into it and and have a listen we're coming into i think the 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 point here that you wanted to make about consistency checks it sounds like you just gave me a couple of examples of of consistency checks um, can can you talk about how consistency fits in here? Well, yeah. I, here's another example. Let's say you have a tank of a reagent of some sort. Um, perhaps it would be orthophosphate, which is commonly injected into the water supply um, to help keep pipes from uh, uh, things like lead from leaching out of the pipe connections and things like that. So orthophosphate, um, typically you would have a metered pump from a tank and you could look at the time that the metered pump has been running, and you can estimate how far down the tank level should have gone. There's a little bit of geometry to figure out, but at the end of the day, you should get a consistent number of runtime versus the tank level dropping, and it should line up. And if it doesn't, that's an indication that something is wrong. You don't necessarily know what. Maybe the level gauge is not in proper calibration. Maybe the metered pump is worn down and it's not putting in the appropriate amount, or maybe somebody's spoofing something. And that's one of the reasons why you might want to have them have these different functions on different controllers. And that makes the job of the attacker that much harder to do because then you have to attack not one controller, but two, and then coordinate them, which is difficult to do. So can you talk some more about that? I mean, you, you've talked about sort of the, the operational value. You can tell that something is going wrong. Um, 
you know, even if you don't have that wrongness uh, instrumented directly. But, you know, can you talk more about security? How how does this, you know, how does this consistency fit into a, a, a security plan? Well, the first thing is you want to make your attacker's job as hard as possible. And you want to look for as many self-consistency checks in a process as possible. So if someone just does a dumb replay attack by replaying your uh, previous uh, uh, instruments against you, well, you'll know that it's wrong because it won't line up with anything else. And that is one of the methods we could use for detecting a problem before it really gets ugly. Maybe you don't even realize that they're there, but maybe if they are replaying things and you're getting the wrong answers, maybe get, getting answers that don't add up, well, that's how you would know that something weird is happening. Not necessarily that you're under a cyber attack, but necessarily, hey, something isn't lining up, let's go look. What Jake is talking about is a, a technique that is detecting attacks, not preventing them. This is part of, uh, you know, attack detection. Um, you know, if we have somebody who is, is into the, the physical process and is stirring the pot without our knowledge, um, even if he's, you know, that, that attacker has blinded us to what, what they're doing directly to, you know, affect the physical process, they cannot necessarily hide the consequences of those actions physically somewhere else. Um, and, and the attack here is called a replay attack. So let me back up to, you know, 2010, the, the Stuxnet attack. Um, one of the, the characteristics of that very sophisticated attack was what's called a replay attack. The, uh, the attacker's code got into the programmable logic controllers, the PLCs, and sat there for I don't know, minutes, days, whatever, um, sat there for a while recording the, the values in the normally running process. And then the attacker said, okay, and started doing nasty stuff to the physical process. But uh, when the control system asked the PLC, so what's happening with this input, what's happening with that input, the attacker started replaying the history of whatever they'd recorded and saying, well, this input has this value, this input has that value, as if nothing was happening. So it was replaying normal values so that what the operator saw was, you know, things in the physical process blowing up, shaking themselves to pieces. And all of the lights on the display that, you know, all of the lights on their, their operator display, the human machine interface, the HMI, they were all green, and so this is a replay attack. And so what, what Jake is talking about is a, uh, an opportunity to detect replay attacks, even if one or two or six PLCs have been compromised and are saying to the operator, it's all green, it's all normal. Um, as long as there are PLCs elsewhere in the process that are still uncompromised and can report, you know, it's normal, but that PLC just said it turned on a pump, and I would expect to see the level on this reservoir increasing if that pump was going, and I don't see that, and raises an alarm that something fishy is going on. You know, it might be a cyber attack. It might be a break in the pipeline, and we might have water gushing out somewhere, but something is not right, and that's what he's detecting is physically something is not right. Andrew, I'm totally following you, um, though I also imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, um, if my PLC data and the physical processes that I'm observing, uh, if there's a discrepancy there, I figure that the chances that that discrepancy can be attributed to malicious activity is probably relatively small compared to, you know, any other explanation, no? That's a good point. Um, you know, the... the uh the occurrence, the, the, the frequency, the, the number of replay attacks that have been reported in the wild is fairly low. This is a comparatively rare attack. Um, you know, but, but two things there. I mean, um, one is that, that uh, yes, it's a rare attack, but it is one of the most sophisticated attacks. It's a symptom of a very sophisticated attack, someone who is trying to bring about a, a nasty physical consequence. And those attacks have been comparatively rare. Um, but the second point here that, that Jake is making, and, and he'll continue making it through the rest of the interview, is um, there are operational benefits to doing this. In his books, this is just good engineering. You should be designing your, 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 your control systems this way anyway, because, uh, you know, if, if a line has ruptured, you need to diagnose that. 
If a line hasn't ruptured and there's weirdness going on security-wise, you need to diagnose that. And the same technique has payback in terms of diagnosing, you know, uh, normal kinds of problems in addition to payback in terms of diagnosing the security problems. So if there's payback, why wouldn't you use this technique, I think is his point. Okay, so if the same symptoms can have different causes, um, how do you determine whether these symptoms are actually caused by a uh, cyber attack? That's a good question. And uh, Jake actually touches on that later in the interview. So um, let's go back to Jake and listen in for a bit. He, he gets to that in, in a couple of minutes. A word from our sponsor. Waterfall Security Solutions is the OT security company. Waterfall's flagship product is the unidirectional security gateway. The gateway hardware is physically able to send information in only one direction, most often from a protected operations network out to an enterprise network. Unidirectional gateway software replicates servers in real time, most often replicating historian databases. Enterprise users can query the replica databases normally. No queries or information or attacks can be sent through the gateway hardware back into the industrial network that might put that network at risk. Unidirectional gateways are safe ITOT integration. For more information on the gateways, please visit Waterfall's website. So it sounds like what you're doing is a, a degree, you're building a degree of simulation of the physical process into the control system. The conveyor going means that the the source level should decrease and the the destination pH should increase, uh, or the pump you know going means that the 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 source level should should reduce and the destination level should increase. How much of this simulation is practical to build into a, a you know a typical control system? It depends on how the the decision on how far to go largely depends on exactly how much work you're willing to do to model the process and to put that model on the online system. Um, so for example, let's take another situation. You have a pump at a pumping station and you've got uh, water elevated water tanks in various parts of your distribution system, all on the same hydraulic system. In other words, the tanks are connected together by pipelines. The levels of all the tanks should go up and down together. And if they report to different master stations, which they could easily do because they're water tanks, you could point one to one master and one to another, then you should see these things going up and down. Having two different masters reporting to these levels means that they'll show up in the control center HMI, but they, if, if someone's monkeying around with the, uh, with the levels, You'll catch it pretty quickly unless they're smart enough to be able to break into two masters simultaneously and coordinate those numbers. So it's a relatively straightforward way of capturing inconsistencies. And that's what we're after. We're trying to capture inconsistencies in the process. And by being that aware, you're also staying ahead of a lot of maintenance headaches and calibration headaches and other routine headaches that plague plants on a regular basis. So is it fair to say that... that um it, what, what it sounds like is that at least one level of this uh, makes sense most of the time. If you have uh, something that you're turning on or turning off, or you know it's even being turned on or off automatically, whatever it is, it's enabling a flow. It is you know enable. It, it's heating something up. It's doing something. It's cooling something off. Is it fair to say that if you do something? then you should look around and say, what is the at least the first level indicator that this is working? And you could you know, try to build in a degree of consistency check in the first level indicator. Or do you go to second and third level sort of global indicators as well? I mean, the first level I can, I can kind of understand, but once you start simulating you know, bigger pictures, it, it, it would seem to get complicated. Have I, have I got that right? Well, it sounds complicated, but it really isn't. I mean, Tank levels, for example, once you've corrected for altitude, which is something that most water utilities would know, um, once you know the altitude of the water, that altitude should read within typically a foot of each other. Um, and uh, largely the differences are because of uh, um, pipe head loss. You know, those are things you can pretty well model depending on what you, how much you know you're pushing into that zone. Um, that's, one, that's one way of looking at it. 
Another way for people who happen to be familiar with aviation is to describe how people fly on instruments. You have a primary instrument that you typically use, such as the artificial horizon, but then you have other instruments as well to indicate a rate of climb and rate of descent, or an altimeter, or an airspeed indicator. And so if you pitch up and you're not climbing, well, that's an indication that something weird's going on, that something's not lining up. And that's when you know to go check the vacuum gauge to make sure your vacuum instruments are working and that the elect you check the electrical system to make sure your electrical instruments are working. You, you, you have an awful lot of options for cross-checking things. And that's what we're aiming to do in, in the process itself is to cross-check things. Because I, I, people have gotten hurt by believing just one gauge. Let me clarify just one tricky point here. Um, you know, I asked the question, uh, if you, you know, it, it, does, a, does a single level of consequence make sense? Which is, you know, um, for anything you do to the physical process, something's going to change. Does it make sense to, to measure the first thing that changes? And he said, uh, you know, on the one hand, yes. But on the other hand, it's not that hard to measure stuff you know, across the world, across the, the in, in his example, the city, when you've got two different reservoirs that have no pumps between them, just, uh, you know, gravity keeping them at the same level. They ought to be at the same level. What he said earlier in the interview, and, and I think, you know, was glossed over, but he's assuming people caught, was that uh, it's important to measure things a little bit further away because they... Th those things are likely to be reported by a different PLC, often by a different PLC subsystem, a different master station talking to a whole set of different PLCs. Um, if we have the action, turn on the pump, and the measurement, you know, the, the pressure in the pipeline increases, if those two, if the action and the measurement are in the same PLC, and we've compromised that PLC and are replaying a bunch of good values from, you know, historically, when we report that the pump turns on, we're going to report that the pressure increases because that, that whole PLC has been compromised. Whereas if we're measuring the pressure in another PLC or in another whole subsystem, it's much harder for a, an attacker to compromise every PLC and every subsystem. And now we've got sort of more independent reporting of discrepancies. So... Um, it's important to measure stuff further away. It sounds like we do have to, if we want to, you know, get the security benefits, we do have to invest in a bit of a, a, a bigger simulation, understanding what consequences of actions are a little, you know, physically further away from the, the, the action. Um, so there is a bit of investment that has to be made. But um, I wanted to say what's coming up now, I think my next question to Jake is about your question earlier, which is, you know, if this weirdness is detected, what do the operators do? So let's, let's go back to Jake and listen in. It sounds like, you know, these, these inconsistencies can sometimes be, be programmed to produce an alarm saying, hey, something's going on. And sometimes, you know, the, the displays just look weird. You know, things aren't showing up the way they should be. Um, is, you know, is this something that operators are trained to deal with normally, or is there a, a special set of training you have to provide for your operators in terms of, of using these indicators and you know, raising an alarm when either a, a physical or a cyber um, incident uh, seems imminent? Well, I have to confess, I have been spoiled because um, the operators I dealt with, by and large, were top-notch. These were people with... Um, many years, if not decades, of experience who would look at the system and realize pretty quickly just by staring at the numbers that something didn't add up. Um, you didn't need alarms with those people because, well, they were probably better than most alarms. They, they were perfectly aware of what they were doing. Um, but on the other hand, many operators have to start from somewhere, and sometimes the best thing you can do is to have a model, a, a water distribution model, running in parallel with the data that you're generating on the SCADA system, and then you actually compare it. it that takes training. It's not something you do trivially. Um, however, that ability to look at something and say, you know what, this doesn't add up, it's, it's going to pay for itself handsomely regardless of whether or not the security features figure into it, because you'll catch pipeline breaks sooner, you'll catch malfunctioning equipment sooner, you'll catch things that's out of calibration sooner. 
And that's really what the goal is, is to eliminate all these headaches so that when an actual attack occurs and you see anomalies that don't line up, you're looking for them already. And if you can't find something that's definitely broken, that's when you start calling in the OT security specialist and you say, hey, we've got stuff that doesn't add up here. And uh, you want to narrow that time down as much as possible. Uh, that's one of the problems. Many of these systems have problems lurking in them for days, weeks, and sometimes even months before it, they're actually discovered and eradicated. And that's a real headache. Um, you know, it, most people want to use methods of network um, communications analysis, but they're trying to analyze the data that's flying by without knowing exactly what it is. This is an opportunity to find out not only what is the data, but does it even make sense? I'm somewhat satisfied with Jake's answer there. It didn't really... Uh, address my question of how you can tell a cyber attack from, you know, an ordinary mechanical failure. Um, but I suppose in some sense that a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, if you can identify an anomaly and, and that anomaly may correspond to one problem or another, uh, regardless of the actual uh, cause, uh, you're probably better off and you could sort of, as he said, um, avoid that headache uh, earlier on in the process. Yeah, um, he he didn't address your question directly because, you know, it was your question. I didn't ask it. But, um, you know, what I heard was uh, the process that, that these operators go through is um, they see an anomaly and they assume that it's a physical problem. So the level in the destination reservoir is not rising, but a massive pump is running. Do we have a massive leak somewhere? They raise the alarm, people start going out. Nobody's reported a massive leak. And they go and look at, at uh, you know, the other reservoir, and the level is not dropping. So they, they start a physical investigation. And when things just start going weird, they go, you know, nothing's gone wrong. In fact, the pump isn't running. They, that that's when you trigger the, the the cyber investigation and start that in parallel to you know further physical investigation. So the the lesson I took was these operators are trained to track down physical problems, and the only additional training they need is when things just go weird, you know pull the trigger, start a, a cyber investigation in parallel, and the two teams start working together to start digging into what's going on here. So because these people are trained to deal with weirdness all day long, you know, they, they diagnose physical problems all day long. So that, that was what I took away. Are they trained to assume that these are physical problems because physical problems are the most frequent kinds of problems that could arise when you notice such a discrepancy? Or is it because physical problems can be the most dangerous um, if they do occur um, so you sort of assume the worst from the outset. I think it has more to do with frequency. I mean, it makes no sense to trigger, uh, you know, a dozen cyber investigations every day when, in fact, what you have is a dozen physical failures across a very large process every day. And you do have, uh, you know, routine failures, uh, you know, pumps stop working or there's power interruptions or, you know, who knows what. And and so they are trained to deal with the, the most frequent problem first. But to Jake's point, um, what you have to do, the, the, the incremental training they need is um, when they see something weird, that's when they trigger the, uh, the cyber investigation. Uh, don't delay that unduly while you try and you know, exhaust every possibility of physical explanation. They, they need to be uh, prompted to trigger a cyber investigation, uh, you know, as soon as their, their gut tells them this is just weird. You know, that's they, they need to they need to be trained to trust their instincts. And, you know, you don't have truly weird situations that often. You're not wasting a lot of effort on, on the part of cyber investigators. You know, to Jake's point, you need to do this sooner, not after months of, of you know, walking around going, this is just weird. You got to do it sooner than that. That's the benefit of, of this technique. OK, so the cyber instances are much rarer than just physical failures. Is there an example that you can give me, though, of when a uh, a uh, problem like this actually was caused by a cyber attack? Uh, there is. I mean, the, the incident that springs to mind is the Maruchi Shire incident, and I think it was 2003 in Australia. Um, 
what you know what the what the operators observed what the whole city the whole township observed was sewage water being pumped onto the lawn of the the city hall onto lawns of parks um it, there was like 80 or 100 incidents of sewage just stinking up the city and this is not supposed to happen and you know there was investigations and people were trying to figure out where's the malfunction and this went on for some time and it was finally you know detected as a cyber incident when um the uh, you know the operator of the water system looked at the screens and everything went weird again and they said what's going on here it's happening again i don't know what's you know the the screens are all inconsistent it just doesn't make any sense and out of frustration that operator finally got up out of his chair physically walked over to the door of the uh, the control room and looked outside at the pumping station that was that was involved in the weirdness on their screens and noticed a pickup truck parked there by the pumping station very close to the microwave tower and said that's strange and called the police the police showed up and sure enough there was a contractor and a former contractor sitting in the pickup truck this was a contractor who was miffed because uh, you know he'd been passed over for uh, being hired as an employee, he wanted to be hired, and they they said no, um, you're staying a contractor. So he was annoyed, and he had all of the test equipment, all the protocols, all the knowledge of how to drive up to a microwave tower, override the signal, because you know from a distant tower the signal is going to be very faint. From his test equipment, it's going to be much stronger than the faint distant signal. Overrides the signal and operates the equipment. So the lesson here is that. Um, you know, the operator finally led the police to the, uh, you know, the, the cyber criminal um, and did it because they said, you know, something is just so wrong. You know, they got out and looked at things. And this is, in a sense, this is the right thing to do. It's not, it's not just the right thing to do cyber-wise. It's the right thing to do operationally. Go and look at what's going on. But the, uh, you know, to Jake's point, the, the only extra bit of training that operators need here, they're already trained to figure out that something is weird and, you know, raise the alarm physically. Once things get truly weird, they have to be trained to say, you know, when it's this weird... I need to see if there's something cyber going on. And that investigation can happen in parallel to the main investigation. So that's the, 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 a, a concrete example from, from some, some time ago, but it was uh, you know, Maruchi Shire, M-A-R-O-O-C-H-Y, if, if you want to look it up. It can be a challenge persuading people to invest in cybersecurity measures. Is this approach uh, you know, any easier to, to fit? into an, an OT security plan? You can't just sell security. It doesn't sell by itself. You need to sell it and also mention some of the other, some of the other side benefits that you get, such as more rapid mean time to repair, such as a better awareness of system uh, performance, such as you know those sorts of things. And by the way, similar things occurred when they started bringing in safety. People could afford to get much closer to the system and see things like that going on. So, you know, if you want to ask the question in terms of, it might be better to ask the question, why am I speaking this way about security? Well, because there are, you can't sell security by itself. So when you're designing one of these these consistency systems that, um, you know, has both operations and, and security benefits, um, who has to be at the table? I mean, do you need contributions from all of engineering, obviously, I guess, um, the security people, the plant operators, who has to be there and, and you know, how, how do you design one of these? Everybody needs to be at the table. You need the engineers, you need the operators, you need the OT network managers, and you definitely need manage, uh, the, the uh, plant superintendents and distribution system managers and people like that. And the reason that I'm trying to bring all these people to the table you're not going to get them together unless there's something more in there besides just security. And let me expound a little bit on that. Security by itself to most organizations doesn't sell. It's overhead. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to feed it. Nobody sees the value in it. It looks like an insurance policy. Nobody likes those things. And they're, they usually go short. Uh, they usually shortchange those sorts of things. So let's turn it around. If you have a good security system, what else do you get with it? 
And that's actually a pretty good point because your mean time to repair goes down because you've got more awareness of what's going on in your system. You catch problems sooner because your self-consistency checks will alert you to them. You also catch security alerts when you talk to the OT people and say, hey, are you seeing any anomalies while I'm seeing this weird looking event? Because that then gives them a cue to say, hey, you know, I'm seeing a spike in traffic, but I don't know what it came from. Um, and it, it gives you additional diagnostics so that you can jump in the middle of this and come up with answers faster. The, the more uptime you have, the more cost justification you can generate, and the easier it is to sell this. What starts me there, obviously, was um, security doesn't sell. Jake said it very matter-of-factly. Um, Andrew, you work in security. Uh, does it sell? You know, the short answer is it depends. It depends very much on who you're talking to. And, you know, Jake Jake is an engineer. He's an engineer's engineer. And, yeah, security is something that may not be high on the agenda for engineers who are focused on safety. They're focused on preventing equipment damage. They're focused on keeping, you know, uh, clean drinking water in the system. Um, but, you know, it depends on... It, Really, it depends on who you talk to. There are there are people in industrial organizations that I work with every day that care very much about security. Um, increasingly, the enterprise security teams, the people who are responsible for all you know cybersecurity in the enterprise, um, are increasingly interested and acting on their mandate in the operations space. Um, and so, you know it. it it depends very much who you talk to, but I take Jake's point that when you're talking to engineers, um, it is easier to sell security if there's something else that they can they can benefit from it. So, for example, um, you know, some time ago we interviewed the folks from SIGA OT Solutions. Uh, they had that uh, a system where you could monitor the raw hardware readings in parallel with the PLC, pump them into the cloud, do some big data analysis, figure out what's normal and what's not kind of automatically, and raise alarms when weirdness starts happening. Often raising alarms before the operators are even aware of the weirdness. Or, you know, a big... Uh, uh, a big selling point from people who sell OT intrusion detection systems. These are the systems that, that look at the network packets and say, you know... Um, there's way more traffic over here than there used to be. Something weird is happening. And again, they provide insight into physical operations, into, not, pardon me, not physical operations, into the, the operation of the control system. The engineers, you know, see the control system as a, a you know, a bunch of wires. They, they see where the endpoints are, but they can't see what's on the wire. Intrusion detection systems let them see what's on the wire. And once they see what's on the wire, they can go, that's not supposed to be there. Why is this? And they get deeper insights into their operations. So, you know, if you've got if you've got benefits for the engineering teams in addition to security by providing deeper insights into physical operations or deeper insights into their control system operations, um, it's often easier to bring them on board and say, yes, you need to make this effort because there's security benefits. And by the way, you're going to see other benefits as well. So that's that's sort of the engineering perspective. But yeah, there's there's a lot of people involved. Every organization is different, and often in 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 a, in a given organization, different departments have very different perspectives on the importance of cybersecurity. So that's a that's a long way of saying it. All depends who you talk to. So Jake, this has been very good. Um, we like to leave our guests with the last word. Is there a thought you would like to leave with our listeners? I've noticed a lot of people coming into the field for the first time, mostly from the IT security side, and we really appreciate them being here because they bring a lot of advanced ideas to the field that we really haven't seen in other venues. Um, but they're not the only ones, and one of the people, one of the groups of people we don't see very much of are the engineers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute, but there's a third group which is really starting to surprise me which are the military veterans. They often come into this field with a very interesting perspective. Most of us are used to building things and making them work. These are people that also think about how it gets destroyed. And honestly, that's a very refreshing perspective because you need that in order to synthesize what an attacker would do. What things do we need to be worried about in a control system to keep it alive? And they bring that frame of mind to the picture. 
they also are good at bringing people together to get them talking to each other. So you get the engineers talking about the process consistency with the people on the OT networking side talking about the traffic that they're seeing and how to explain it. Um, but most of all, we're missing engineers because there's a lot more people working on the process engineering side and the security is virtually a blind spot to them. They don't understand the issues and uh, nobody has ever brought this up to them in school. And there are very few sessions in um, most of the industry trade magazines that discuss this in a, in a comprehensive manner. So there's stuff there. They're stuck out there looking at, at very little information and they don't know what they could bring to the table. That's one of the things we need to get more involved in is bringing the engineers to the table showing them what we're concerned about, and then getting answers as to how we could address that. Many times they have very simple solutions of self-consistency checks that solve a lot of problems and detect a lot of things before they get ugly. And it saves everybody a lot of grief, and it, keeps us keep, it helps keep our systems simple. And that's really, at the end of the day, that's one of the biggest security things of all, is keeping things simple and making sure that everybody understands it. Andrew, how about your last word? Well, I wanted to uh, echo a couple of things that Jake said here. Um, the first one is I, I agree completely with his uh, his comment about the military veterans. Um, you know, engineers know a lot about how to make things work. The veterans know a lot about how to attack things. And this is a, a, a very useful insight. Um you know, I've maintained for, for a long time that the, the best way to evaluate the strength of a given, you know, cybersecurity defensive posture is to figure out how it might still be successfully attacked. Understanding attacks is vital to designing and evaluating defenses. You know, the, the attack mindset is valuable. Penetration testers in the cyberspace have it. The veterans have it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I very much second that. Uh, you know, there's, there's opportunity in, the, in this space for people to come in who understand attacks, who instinctively think about attacks and defenses. And the second point is, you know, his point was, his main point is, we need more engineers in this space. Um, and so, you know, I will, let me reinforce that by saying, look, um, the you know, computers are getting cheaper. There's more computers everywhere. All computers have software. There's more software everywhere. There's more targets for cyber attack every day that goes by. And all these targets are more connected. The, uh, you know, the opportunity to attack is increasing. The cybersecurity space in my books is, you know, cybersecurity problem is going to get much worse before it gets any better. Um, if, you know, if there's engineers listening who want to get involved in cybersecurity, who, who are looking for an opportunity to branch out into a different specialization, you know, they've done something for 10, 15 years, they'd like a change. The security space is one that is going to only grow the cybersecurity space, especially the OT cybersecurity space, is only going to get, uh, you know, more opportunities as time goes by for the foreseeable future. So, you know, by all means, if you're interested, get involved. Okay, let's end there. Thanks to Jake Brodsky for speaking with you, Andrew. And thank you, Andrew, for speaking with me. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Nate. Thank you to all our listeners. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.